G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Your boy Jesse is back making content again. Obviously football is right around the corner. We've got about, you know, like a week or so before it all kicks off, which is all just absolutely delightful. And now it's time for me to resume making footy content full time again for you guys it's been good to have a little break i've been doing a lot of preparation for the season ahead so hopefully we have some reasonable content coming out in the next few weeks and beyond before we really crack into it guys i do just want to say thank you so much to all the people who have supported this channel through the off season um i uh, i was working pretty hard through the off season and obviously the views started to dip so i decided to maybe take a little break and um sort of all my resources and energy into making content for the actual season but I do want to say in my last video I got a lot of nice comments um, that I really really appreciate and there's a bunch of you as well who just about comment on every video I don't take it for granted I really really appreciate all the support you've given me and uh, on a related note I do want to give a little shout out to a new youtuber his name is Brody Allen you might recognize him from the comments on a lot of these videos he started his own channel um, and he's making some really cool compilation content at the moment. It's just the beginning for him. I'm going to put the link in the description of this video. You should go check out his channel because it is worth it. But anyway, guys, in today's video, I'm going to be doing a video that I have been wanting to do for the best part of eight months since the grand final. We've had one round of football. And uh, that, of course, is my weekly tips video. So finally, finally, after about two or three months, I get to do round two's predictions. If you haven't joined already, make sure you look in the link in the description of this video for our footy tipping competition. It's not too late to join, I don't think. And I think there's a password, which is also in the description to join up. So go ahead, join us. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. But anyway, guys, let's crack into the video with Thursday Night Footy. We've got Collingwood and Richmond taking uh, place at the G, which will be a, uh, needless to say, really exciting game. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, this is a potential grand final matchup, probably my prediction for the current grand final matchup. You got Collingwood obviously hosting it, sort of. Um, they looked very scary in round one. I think Grundy had a day out against Tim English, which he does pretty much every time they play. He had 37 hit outs, one goal, three, 19 possessions. To be honest, they came out and looked angry. They've had two heartbreaking ends to the previous two seasons, and they're playing like they want to make it this year, their year. Uh, 22 scoring shots to nine against a doggy side that was rated to, you know, be a good chance. In fact, I think it tipped the dogs in an upset, um, but they absolutely put them to the sword. I had to think about what I was going to end that sentence with. On the Richmond side of things, they played the, the Blues, obviously, in the season opener. It was a weird game. They kicked seven goals to two in the opening term. And uh, at that point, you're just like, holy shit, Richmond haven't slowed down at all. But then they sort of, it's hard to say whether they sort of either put the cue in the rack or they generally allowed Carlton to get on top of them. But, uh, you know, the Blues sort of fought back. Jack Martin had five goals. It was a typical Richmond's performance where they didn't really have any massive individual performance. I think Jack Rewell kicked three, uh, but it was pretty well spread throughout the, the workload. There's kind of a good rivalry building between Collingwood and Richmond. They've been trading wins in recent years. I don't really know who's going to win this game, but I'm going to probably tip the pies to take this one out. I feel like at the, well, in round one, that were probably the most impressive side. And I'm, I know that was months ago, but I'm going to back them in to take that form into round two. I think Colling was going to win this by 18 points. Next up, we have the Friday night game at uh, GMHBA Stadium. Geelong taking on Hawthorne. They haven't played at this ground against each other since 2006, which is just a sign of how these two sides are sort of a blockbuster game. Now, the Cats, there's a lot of people assuming they're going to have a little bit of a drop-off this year because they're older and obviously losing Tim Kelly hurts. Round one, they were kind of just cut up by a good giant side. Danger was well held by DeBoer. And you had Gaz and Mitch Duncan putting up a good fight. But overall, I just think they came up against a very good side. I don't really subscribe to this theory that Geelong's going to drop off this year. On the other side of the ledger, you got the Hawks coming off, um, admittedly, again, three months ago or whatever it was. Uh, they cut up the Lions at the G. The Lions are a good side, but there was they're not good at the MCG and that, you know... You have to take that with a pinch of salt, even though there was no crowd. It's still a very unknown variable, the extent to which teams will have a home ground advantage, but I won't delve into that too much. I do think the Hawks are a good team this year. I probably even might tip them to pip Geelong on the final ladder. What they also have going for them is Tom Mitchell has an extra couple of months of maybe not conditioning as such, but time to heal from his broken leg. 
um, which I think could probably help. I think he had 25 posies in round one. Um, but I think psychologically, maybe he gets a bit of a benefit there as well. You had Wingard fit and firing in round one, had three goals and 20. Um, there's a lot to like about Hawthorne this year. They've won three of the last, uh, yeah, three of the last five, despite being an inferior side. So they kind of have a good record against Geelong. GMHBA is a really unknowable sort of variable in this with no crowd. I'm going to still say Geelong, as the home side, will get the chocolates. They're going to win this game in a thriller by seven points. Next up, we have Brisbane hosting Fremantle in the Queensland hub at the Gabba. Now, Fremantle actually haven't played at the Gabba for three years, and their last trip there saw an 11-goal loss. Last time they met was in Perth when Mickey Walters hit the point, uh, point post, or no, sorry, the goal post, after the siren to win by one point. Now, obviously, you got the Brisbane hosts coming off a season where they finished second last year, bowed out in straight sets. They've got a fit and healthy list last year, sorry, this year and like last year. So that's going to be something they need to maintain. So that's something they've done very well. In fact, keep their list fit and healthy. They were pretty average in round one against a, a good Hawthorne team at the MCG. For them, they're a strong side. It's just going to be the mental battle to go again. And it'll be that'll be a question mark over a lot of teams going into round two, how well they psych themselves up for this game. Fremantle, by contrast, also had a very weird round one. The Bombers were kind of a hot team in the preseason, and they started well against Frio, but then Frio kind of clawed them back. I think both Essendon and Frio, but specifically Frio here, are sides that will benefit from the layoff because they've had a lot of injuries coming back. I do think Fremantle are a good side, or a decent side, and a competitive side when they're fully fit. Guys like Maybe not Alex Pierce back yet, but Hamling and potentially David Mundy sort of reinforces that side. I expect Fremantle to put up a good early challenge here, but I'm going to say Brisbane, the home side, are too good a team. They're going to win this game by 32 points. Next up is Carlton hosting Melbourne at Marvel Stadium of all places, and this is a particularly hard game to peg for me. Carlton again had a weird round one. They had a late surge despite getting toweled up in the first quarter against Richmond. Uh, I mentioned Jack Barton before. He looks like a huge addition with five goals. I did question how well he'd fit into this um, sort of very much still developing Carlton side. Uh, but, you know, he was an absolute beast in round one. It's hard to know what to make of that performance. But if they are serious about rising up the ladder this year, which I think they need to be, then this is a must-win game in a lot of respects. On the other hand, I think the Ds have a better list, but I've been questioning their mental state, particularly after falling into the bottom two last year. You get, it's hard to sort of re, reinvent that confidence that got them into the 2018 prelim. They also haven't played Carlton at Marvel Stadium since 2009, which is bizarre. I think that kind of plays into Carlton's hands. From what I understand, I don't think Melbourne are particularly good at Marvel, and I feel like Carlton, you know, at least are more comfortable at that ground. I do think Melbourne are the better side. They've got the better list, but I'm actually going to tip Carlton here to win by 10 points. Next up is the Battle of the Coast, the Gold Coast Suns hosting my beloved Eagles at Metricon Stadium. And I think it's smart to have this, this fixture in the first of the hub games because the Eagles are sort of going to claim Metricon as a, as a home ground away from home. So this is still a true home game for Gold Coast because West Coast will have not played a game there yet. Obviously, Gold Coast had a horror start to the season in round one. They usually start seasons well, so I was banking on them throwing everything at round one, but they were really, really disappointing against a, a pretty slick Port Adelaide site, it has to be said, but to score 29 points is a very, very poor offering. There's still a lot of youth and they're a very young side. I think this will be a tough game for them against a very battle-hardened West Coast unit. Obviously, the Eagles put away a D side in round one, which again, it's hard to gauge how good the Ds are. And the Eagles obviously played at home. I thought the, the level of football was pretty decent from the Eagles in round one. Tim Kelly in particular fit in very well. The Eagles are a good side. Let's just call it what it is. And I think this is going to be tough for the Gold Coast to win. I'm going to tip the Eagles to win this by 44 points. And I hope they don't make me look like a fool for that. Next up, we've got the South Australian Showdown. Port taking on the Crows at Adelaide Oval. Now, Port are currently the ladder leaders after, you know, I just mentioned they slogged, they slogged? They flogged Gold Coast uh, by something like 47 points in round one. They're actually got a pretty good list mix at the moment, I think, between experienced and talented youth. I think they're in a lot better shape than the Crows, which is something I've expressed over the off season. These sides do have a great rivalry, though. Unlike West Coast and Frio, they kind of trade wins, whereas West Coast and Frio kind of trade winning streaks. Um, which is quite interesting. Um, the Crows obviously had a, what I would 
described going into it as a bottom four clash against the Swans in round one, which was, you know, a good, actually a decent battle. Uh, I kind of have these sides lower on the uh, on the ladder in my preseason predictions, but it wasn't terrible football, at least I didn't think so, uh, compared to what I was expecting. But for the Crows, that was definitely a, a, you know, a big opportunity for a win gone begging at home. I do, I've said it before, I think the Crows just have a lot of youth to cycle through this squad um, throughout the season. I don't see them having a good year this year, and that's why in this game, I'm going to tip Port to win by 28 points. Next up is the GWS Giants hosting North Melbourne at Giants Stadium. Now, I mentioned it, Ge uh, GWS torched Geelong, well, kind of torched, by 32 points in round one. They had a very good showing. I thought they were very slick offensively. I think they had the equal higher score with Richmond for the round. Himmelberg was the best on ground with four goals and 20, and then Toby Green also had four goals and 16. So a very good start for a side that obviously got smashed in the grand final last year. They needed to make a statement in round one. They did, and I think that will probably have benefited them going into the long break as opposed to having a loss around one again on top of the grand final. So I think they're strong all over the ground. It's just about the mental game, but I'm pretty confident about where they're at at the moment. North in round one had a big comeback against the Saints. It was a great game of footy, actually, for two sides that I had in the bottom six or seven, I'd say, on the ladder originally. They're a side that gets easily written off. I do, I have them above, you know, the top four, uh, bottom four teams, rather. Um, I just think they're a really tough and gritty competitive team. They've still got to add use to this list, in my opinion. But the experienced players are decent. That being said, I don't think their talent will hold a candle to the Giants in this game, particularly traveling. It's going to be a tough trip. I really rate the Giants. I think in the, they're going to win this game by 47 points. The penultimate game of the round is the Sydney Swans hosting Essendon at the SCG. The Swans have lost a lot of experience this offseason, and I've tipped them to not fall down the ladder as such because they're already bottom four, but I don't expect them to rise this year. I think they have great young talent, some of the best young talent in the league in terms of an entire sort of unit, um, and it was enough to get them over the line in round one. I do think their midfield is a little top heavy. Luke Parker and Josh Kennedy are probably off the top of my head by far the best two midfielders, and then there's some young players beyond that. I think they're good enough to catch teams napping this year, but I think it's another rebuilding year for them. Now, the Dons are another question mark, as they always seem to be. They had a great preseason. They had a, they had excuses to, to not play well in the preseason, considering how many operations they had, sort of similar to Melbourne 12 months previous. But they came to Perth. They beat the Eagles in the preseason. And I can't remember who they played in the second game. Was it Geelong? And I think they did well. But then their round one was a typical Essendon performance, just not complete. They started really well against S uh, sorry against Fremantle, another injury struck side, and they allowed Fremantle to get in uh, pretty much and control the game in the second half. And uh, to only win by six points is you know not a great way to tick the box, but I guess a win's a win. But I think they're another side to benefit from a long layoff because they're going to get some players back, hopefully. I haven't seen the injury list, but I presume that they're going to be in better shape physically. I do know that Essendon haven't won at the SCG since 2009. I will tip them to break that drought. It's going to be a thriller. I tip the Dons to win this by five points. The final game of round two is St. Kilda hosting the Bulldogs at Marvel Stadium. Now, we saw the Saints were bitterly disappointed to lose round one. They're a side that, again, needed to prove that they're ready to come up the ladder under a new coach, Brett Ratton. Um, they've recruited five best 22 players, albeit they lost a few as well. And I think this result for them would be very, very painful, having led by 31 points early in the third term. And I think North were down to one player on the bench. To let that slip is a massive failure, but I guess that can be forgiven for sort of a young Developing side that still needs to sort of come together and sort of, you know, consolidate their team chemistry as well with a lot of new faces. But overall, a very, bit, like, really disappointing loss, I would say. This is the year to prove themselves, and I think they've had a very bad start. In this game, they're coming up against another side with a lot of uh, high expectations. The Bulldogs, obviously, there's a little bit of pressure sort of building on beverage. To make the finals last year was a relative success considering they sort of dropped off after, you know, missing the, or winning the premiership. But obviously a bad finals showing last year and then a terrible round one against Collingwood where they got torched. Certainly Collingwood are playing very, were, were playing very good football and the Bulldogs just didn't have an answer to that. Only nine scoring shots for the game. Admittedly, Norton was underdone in round one. So hopefully that is some upside for them now. But their forward line, as I talked about at the time, looked a little bit impotent so, and a little bit one-dimensional. Even though their midfield's great, there might be some concerns 
concerns with the Bulldogs there. But to end this rant, I think the midfield is strong enough and perhaps the break will give them time to sort of mull over that terrible round one. They'll come back refreshed. I do think they're a better side than the Saints and that's why I have to tip them. The Bulldogs are going to win this game by 23 points. Anyway, guys, that is all my tips for round two. As I said at the start of the video, make sure you check out the link in the description to join our footy tipping competition. It feels so good to be back doing round predictions and uh, I will see you, you know, somewhere on YouTube. I've got a heap of videos coming out. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next tipping prediction video for round three. Thanks for watching, guys, and take care of yourselves. Cheers.